All of the marketing for gig economy platforms is about this idea of community and entrepreneurship and being your own boss. And you can work whenever you want, wherever you want, and you can fit it in between your schedule, your schoolwork, your raising of children. You can be anyone and you can be anywhere. I can do it almost anywhere. I can do it at home, naked if I want to. And coming together with other people, and this is gonna be this great movement forward. You can have whatever lifestyle you want and still have a job thanks to technology and thanks to this app. These platforms have marketed themselves as offering entrepreneurship to the masses. Let's give drivers a new way of thinking and a new way of working and gather everybody on our, on our platform. Not only have we like offered these new jobs, but we've totally fixed the job. The possibility here is that we could have security and autonomy in this new digital age. What they are saying is complete bullshit because I have the proof. They give you like a temporary registration through DMV. Um, so I have the proof of that, but I just didn't display it on, uh, on, on the dashboard. The owner of the vehicle is going to receive a summons uh -huh. by mail for, for the registration. But I have the proof. Down. Yeah, but I just I forgot okay. about it, but I still have the so proof of fine. it. That's you fine, can, you can't put it on now. But right. the, the thing is that I didn't receive that registration, which I have to stick on. You can you can tell that to the judge okay. when you go to the court, or when the owner goes to the court. Okay. Okay? okay? But there has to be some sort of a break for the drivers, because we are going through so much that's stuff. That's why they have the, now, the, this, the commission this, holds this ticket, meetings. Uh -huh. The commission holds meetings open to everybody. Right. You can go to the commission meeting. But the commission is not doing anything. No, that's why you have you can you can go and express. They're your not doing anything. There. I mean, okay. like nine drivers have committed suicide, brother. I know. Yeah. There are a lot of cops committing suicide still. So, right? Yeah, but I mean, but, but that's not, not the answer. All these here but, have to yeah. open the road for the traffic. Right. But, all right? but, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. We have okay. to fix the system, right? Like I didn't even make any dollar yet, and I get a ticket. Did you work today? Or? No. I was, I was, I'm going to start later on tonight if I'm not locked out, which I am because there's no hours I can book. So I have to go into the busy area while I'm locked out to see if I can even make like, you know, $100 tonight. That's junk. I don't know if you see in the trunk, I have a, a big, you know, pizza carrier. This is the kit when I signed up. They gave me this shirt, these two heat insulated bags that say DoorDash on them, and that sign, delivery in progress drivers nearby. So if I have to park less than legally, I got the hot pizza carrier in the, bo in the trunk for free after I did like 30 deliveries or 60 deliveries. So I hit Dash now. Ready to go, and then you hit start dashing, and this is the screen you see when you're online and ready to pick up work. Oh, I got an order from the chicken place in Patchog Village. To not go very far, and time-wise shouldn't take that long, I'll get paid $9.83, I believe it said, which is an ideal 
pick up. On average, they're more like $7 and change to $8. They don't compensate you for gas. Sometimes they don't really, actually a lot of times, they don't really compensate you um, the way they should for mileage. Like if you're going to a place that's not close to you. So now we're entering Patchogue Village, which is the main area of work in, in this part of Long Island. Okay, so this is where I'm going to go. The chicken place is on is through this little mall here on, on Main Street, but it's just too too much of a hassle to get there on Main Street. All right. So I got my red bags. <laughs> We have this church over here with that cross. Uh, it has a history, uh, you know, 9-11. One of the landing gears of the plane hit the, hit, the, hit the cross and it bent. As a New Yorker, we bend, but we don't break. And this is the message what we want to tell Uber. Basically, you are living on the streets. We commute so many people and we take them like everywhere, parties, you know, restaurants, meetings. Some are getting late, they're telling us, oh, we're getting late, can you speed up? I have to catch a flight. And like we get to see people with their emotions. So I started in uh, 2011 when Uber was starting in New York. And at that time, they would give drivers a thousand dollars sign up bonus, you know. But Uber was like, as it came out as a, as a tech company, they were like, you know what, we got everything covered. All you have to do is just accept the ride and, and drive and we'll do all the calculations for you. When Uber started, 3,000 a week, you know, 4,000 a week. And literally now, we are making like maybe like a quarter of it. It's all, it's all sorts. The average customer, it's like, it's not like a bunch of lazy people. It's a lot of people need this because they're too busy with kids or they don't have a license for whatever reason. People also that are just drunk or stoned and they don't want to drive, they're actually being responsible and they don't want to drive and get the food themselves. So I'll deliver to them. You know, there's plenty of times I'll come to a door and the door will open and so much pot smoke will come out and the person's eyes are like super red. And I love that. I know that's so funny when it's like some guy, he's like college age and he's just like, oh, thank God the food's here. Hi, got your order here. There you go. Thank you. Right, enjoy. Have a good night. Thank you, you as well. Uh, all right, so that was a decent day. I didn't uh, go too hard because I just didn't have the need to work that long today. I got stuff I got to take care of later. But just a few hours, I would say that was uh, in four and a half hours, I made uh, $80, you know? So it's like, roughly comes out to like 20 bucks an hour. So that was, that was a good day for, you know, that short amount of time. That's a great amount of money in my book. Boom, boom. 
say hi. <laughs> Sometimes, like, you know, you have to go to kids event in the school, right? But then like workers ex exhaustion, like, you know, because you're working like uh, 12, 14 hours to be into that, that, that system and then taking time out, it becomes hard. You want more? Yum, yum. Yeah. Yum, yum. yum. He picks up people and he drives, us, drives them where they have to go and then they give him money. My dad does Uber. He drives a lot. Sometimes he comes home late. Sometimes he doesn't come home in the evening, but he. But sometimes he does. Would you wish you could see him more? Yes. He's never home. Mm -hmm. He's always out on the road trying to make as much as he can and he can still not make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy because then the kids lose out on time. I lose out on time with him. And like the house is it's just not complete without a man being home. I usually eat shortly before I leave, and I'm very fond of bran flakes. I'm, I'm loving bran flakes recently. I usually have tea and food right before I hit the road. <laughs> so okay, so this current week, I've worked a few days, I think two, two or three days, and I got $231.84. Last week I did a few days, so it was almost 300. And you know, that's at my leisure. I can make as little or, or as much money as I want, which is why this job is worthwhile. Apparently they, they think I'm doing a great job. So I got put into the Dasher Rewards program, which makes it easier for me to dash. I don't have to deal with the, the same scheduling problems I've been dealing with recently. I really have no restrictions on the time that it, that it takes for me to start now. Whereas last week and for the previous year and a half, I had to deal with scheduling blocks and that was becoming an issue because there's a lot of people signing up to do this job because it's pretty popular. It says I can't go online, reserve a guaranteed time. I've been locked out from Uber's system right now because it's uh, less demand. And I've been in the city since um, 12 p.m. this afternoon. They have oversaturated the market and they have over like 120,000 drivers. Why did TLC allow it to happen at the first place when they were adding in so many cars? Because you cannot get a TLC plate just from like an Uber office, it's a whole process. And now drivers like me and others who are being locked out, they're sitting in the city uh, in the busy area and waiting for them to go back online. The drivers who are renting the cars, who are leasing the cars, or who still have payments. I mean, a truck like this cost about like $1,200 $1, plus the insurance. I only got like two hours, three hours to work today. Tomorrow I have none. Reserve, so I reserve all my hours, but for tomorrow it's all full. I, I don't even have a single hour. The other day, I made $37 in like five hours. Uh, only one hour I had uh, time to go online. And I live in Staten Island, so I actually went home negative because I already put like gas in my car and like the tolls. Well, I wouldn't see my kids tonight. Like, and by the time uh, they wake up for school, that's the time when I wake up like five ten minutes i see them is there any um is seniority taken into account in terms of blocking blocking no it, it just it just takes uh they don't care i mean like it, it's it's a machine it's it, it's an algorithm the older you are the more of a liability you are to uber and lyft because you know more about their algorithms and you know more of their history if you are a new driver you will be getting 80 percent more trips than the older driver, so it's 80 to 20 ratio. Uh, that's that's how you get to be an old driver with Uber or Lyft. The algorithms for these gig platforms are incredibly opaque. Um, drivers and workers have really no idea how it is that they end up getting work. So while you have uh, uh, 
you know, what is now referred to as the algorithmic boss, right? And uh, that uh, really guides the everyday work uh, of uh, um, these independent contractors in a very uh, opaque way. So there's very little transparency. So what Uber sees and what uh, the driver sees is completely different. A lot of these platforms like put you inside of a game um, and set the parameters to try to influence you to act a certain way. So like uh, Uber will not say, we want you to drive on Friday night. What they'll say is like, you can get paid twice as much on Friday night as when you want to drive, so you decide. And if a driver has been going for a couple of hours and seems to be getting close to maybe wanting to log off, they'll do things like flash a message saying, oh, you're so close to a goal of making $100 today. Or, oh, here's a contest that you can do. And if you accept a certain number of rides within a certain period of time, then we'll give you a bonus. So there are all these kind of like subtle ways that these companies are able to control people through an app um, that aren't like technically managing them according to the companies, but have that effect. There's there's a thing that's supposed to not matter, which is called an acceptance rate. And uh, some people have been reporting that if their acceptance rate is low, meaning that they get job restaurants that they don't want to go to for whatever reason, they hit no, which is supposed to be within our, our power and no, no rep negative repercussions. They've been saying that they thought that all of a sudden they started getting less work or lower paying work. So this is like, um, I think it's like a, an air cushion that they give to people in the hospital. Is that really what it's for? Oh, it's something for me medical from the hospital for people. It's an air pillow. So mom got it for me to sit on in the car. What was that chime? Um, so that was them trying to get me to uh, pick up another order at George's Luncheonette. So chicken place and George's Luncheonette. I turned it down as I've been doing more and more because they try to offer you two, sometimes three pickups at once with the idea being the restaurants are close to each other and the customers are close to each other. That makes sense. Never the, almost never the case. And so I've been like declining double orders more and more because it's just not worth it. And things do inevitably go wrong where you go to one restaurant and the food's just not ready. And then you have to wait and wait and it's, it's a big hassle and over, time every time I do it like at least 50% of the time my customer satisfaction score goes down which is the only score that actually matters if I'm gonna you know be able to keep my job so um, they, if your score goes real low that's that's grounds for termination or what they call deactivation it's really unclear about how people get work um, but what is clear is that if workers aren't playing by the rules they will often see that there are available work definitely drops off. And until they kind of shape up and start following the rules of the platform, they're pretty much unemployed. I also work with uh, AIW, Alliance for Independent Workers and uh, Hashtag Drivers Unite movement. So it started when Uber was releasing their IPO and uh, we called out a nationwide protest May 8th. Since that day, I've seen a significant uh, decrease in my earnings on Uber's platform. I, sometimes I would be online for like four or five hours and I wouldn't get a single ride. And that's what shows that how they are manipulating, you know, um, the drivers. Nobody like foresaw that Uber was going to be this giant startup. Um, which is hard to remember, like this idea that you would trust someone to pick you up and press a button or call a car this way. So Uber starts out in San Francisco as a luxury car service, um, twice the price of a cab and something you can call via app. And then they very quickly start to expand out. All their advertising was about like how this is a step on the American dream. You know, this is gonna launch you into entrepreneurship and you're gonna be your own business. Um, and they actually expand to New York as one of their next markets. And they actually get shut down by the TLC because they're trying to say that you can call a taxi with the Uber app. And that wasn't allowed by the TLC. The high regulation has created environments where there's been stagnation for decades, like I described in yeah. New York with the taxis. And so it becomes 
ripe for disruption. So then the tech comes in, it moves faster than regulatory regimes can move or control it, let's say. Uh, and, then, and then now you've got a situation where you know, people are scrambling. So my, my night guy takes a full day on Monday, and he works also six days a week, but a double on Monday. When he started putting stuff in the trunk and I asked him what it was about, he said, I, I started selling jeans in JFK because it was, hard for, it was hard for him to make ends meet. So four years ago, uh, my father unfortunately passed away and, uh, and left behind my grandmother, which is her. And, and uh, also left behind a New York City taxi medallion. But unfortunately, it owed uh, about 520000 He loved being a New Yorker. And owning a piece of New York was something that he just, he just, all he wanted to do. And he was just so proud of it. He said, hey, this is how we're going to retire. There's only uh, roughly about 13500 uh, of these medallions out there. There is 140,000 uh, Uber, Lyft cars via rideshare cars. Yellow cabs before rideshares would have made 400 uh, on an eight hour day. And now we're squeezing by just at a 12 hour shift, we could squeeze by 300, maybe 350. The city knew the effects of um, what these medallions were gonna, they're gonna drop the prices of these drops, but yet the TLC was still auctioning them off uh, for 800,000, 900,000. In the beginning, um, you know, I met, I met taxi drivers itself at taxi stands and one of these guys that, uh, that, were, that I met was Kenny Chow. And he was kind of like the big brother teaching me because there were so many little things that I didn't really know. Unfortunately, he was one of the eight people who, uh, who committed suicide uh, because of the amount of debt that he was under and pressure he was under. But in the beginning, he's the one that told me not to worry about the debt, that the city would uh, will make it right. It really hit me a certain way. I remember I was next to my girlfriend. I just started just bawling just because I, I just felt like he was just such a good guy. Like, I don't hate these Uber drivers. It's not Uber drivers that I, I have a problem with. And the biggest problem with me, it's, it's, it's obviously is the fact that they exploit the drivers and I, I, I feel sorry for them. I really hope this resolves soon. Um, I, I, I bought a ring for my girlfriend and um, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna present it to her, uh, but I do worry about the future. I could be doing something else, I guess, uh, and give up the medallion loan somehow. But again, I I feel like I'm I'm in too deep, and I I personally really just I, I this industry needs help, and I feel like I can help. Um, and I've met a lot of people that are willing to do the same, so I'm gonna keep fighting. The gig economy actually comes out of the sharing economy and it develops during the Great Recession. So during the Great Recession, we have workers struggling to make ends meet. We have a high level of unemployment. After 2008, with the financial crisis, uh, a lot of people were looking for work and were willing to take on uh, this very underpaid work uh, on, uh, that was mediated through these platforms. You know, there had long been freelancers and independent workers going back decades decades, but now in the aftermath of 2008, you have the smartphone, which allows the visible digital economy 
to be part of our everyday lives. We saw the rise of smartphones and contactless payment systems, and also of computer technologies that allowed for reviews and for revisions to websites, so people could post ratings. We have Uber that quickly expands. We have Grubhub, which quickly expands. And these kinds of logistical workers uh, become part, at least, at least if you live in an urban setting, part of your everyday lives for how you get around and how you eat. Neighbor Goods, the safe and fun community where you can save and earn money by sharing stuff with your friends and neighbors. In the early stages of the sharing economy, most of the focus is on free or low cost products. So we have couch surfing, we have food swaps and clothing swaps. We have more focus on websites that allow people to borrow things from their neighbors, like share some sugar and neighbor goods. A language that uh, launched, uh, com that was used by companies like Uber in the initial stages, for sure, uh, that uh, you know, activated uh, the language of the 1970s uh, counterculture, language of love and, and sharing and peer-to-peer -peer culture. Um, and then as the recession is coming to a close, we start to see more of a focus on monetizing these products. And then we see Airbnb, we start to see Uber, we see TaskRabbit, and the focus moves away from low cost access and sharing to people being able to make a profit off of what they're doing. A little squiggle right in the center of it is actually none other than Trent Reznor's autograph. I've been playing music since I was 12, but have never done it in any sort of professional capacity. I'm also an aspiring amateur filmmaker and writer and illustrator and you know, 10 other arty, artsy fartsy things. So what are your like plans for the future? I mean, how do you see yourself in like 20 years? Or... 20 years? This is how I see myself in 20 years. <laughs> I mean, 20 years from now, I'll be 57. Actually, that's a long time. I'll be going on 60. I want to be making money doing something with my talents, with the music and acting. If I'm still having to do something like this 20 years from now, life didn't turn out the way Michael planned. Let's put it that way. And that very well may happen. And I'll just be rolling with the punches at, at 20 years from now and doing whatever I can to get by. And that could be a perfectly happy and fine existence. We have cake, we have whipped cream, and we have strawberries. <laughs> well, this is for uh, Grandpa. It's his birthday. Actually, it's a week after his birthday. So we're finally able to get together and celebrate. I like the idea that DoorDash is the kind of job that you can do it if you have other things you need to do or a kind of schedule that you can't stick to a regular nine to five. But I can't picture him doing that for a very long time. You know, I wouldn't want him to see wouldn't want to see him doing that for twenty years. I'd like to see him doing something else. Yeah, you know, hopefully you wanna strive to get something where you make enough money that you really can put a lot of money away for the future because you don't know what the future holds. But yeah, yeah as a parent, I'm concerned about that. Um, but I don't see DoorDash as a long-term type of career. I see it as a as a, a short-term or a secondary job to supplement your, your main career. Happy birthday to you. So there's two visions of what digital labor platforms is about. One is global cheap labor and one is global best labor. Global cheap labor is the idea that you just want to have commodity jobs being done where any human anywhere at any time could do this. Is this picture a cat? Is this picture not a cat? 
The other way to think about it is global best labor, which is where do I find the talent I need for my job? And so this is the vision of Upwork, which is the global best labor, versus the vision of something like Mechanical Turk, which is global cheap labor. Never heard of it, they're okay. It's pretty much like choosing, like, you get a series of choices and you have to pick um, which headphone to choose. They looked about the same, so I'll go with the one that has uh, the better star rating. Okay, that was easy. Quick code, copy, paste. That was easy, 25 cents in like two minutes. Not bad. Today, I did about 63 hits for $3.47, but I got a bonus for $5.60. It's mostly surveys. I say 90% is surveys. Once in a while, somebody will put out to test an app. Another time, someone will want you to click something. The typical one, I think average, I may get like 40 cents a task. The lowest paying task I've done, probably a penny, but it's usually something that takes 30 seconds to do. Well, I haven't personally done this, but I've seen a task where somebody wanted you to take pictures of your feet and submit it to them. I think somebody was looking for pictures for their foot fetish website. It paid like 50 cents. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. No way in hell. When I drive for Lyft, I need to take my car out no matter what. But M Turk, I can do it at home, naked if I want to. I can do it at work. I can do it almost anywhere. So Mechanical Turk is a platform run by Amazon where you can go and you can um, get small tasks completed by like this um, kind of army of uh, people who are willing to do them for um, often like a very low amount of money, like a couple of cents at a time. In the early 2000s, um, Amazon had uh, a business need that it needed solving. Uh, it had started aggregating um, catalogs from other publishers and it was a little bit hard to disambiguate uh, if two catalog entries pointed or referred to the same book. So Amazon um, hired human labor to do this and that eventually grew into Mechanical Turk. It might be things like labeling images, which is necessary for building AI or taking surveys, um, writing product descriptions. It's basically a place where Requesters can come and post jobs, and workers can come and do those jobs for pay. It's that simple. Oh, a $3 one. Let's see. Let's try this one. You'll be given a sentence, and you'll be asked whether or not it's I for insight or A for analysis. You're trying to see how these three words go together. Oh, this is confusing. Um, I really don't get what's going on here. Oh, this is slow. Gap, door sign. I don't know. You know, sometimes you'll get tasked and it's like, sometimes it is a struggle to do. You're wondering why you're going on. You really don't want to think about it too much. Sometimes just things like this don't make sense. So you're just going, going. Um, this one's a bit tedious, this task. Yes. I may quit this. I don't know. Yeah, that completion bar is not going anywhere. Sometimes the subreddits, they say, if Enter gets too much exposure, so many people will join it. But after, you know, after they see how I know, frustrating this thing can be sometimes. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave this. Even for $3, that was not worth it. So basically phone farming is the use of cell phones to earn money online. You can earn something like two, three, four dollars a day maximum. Uh, we call this passive activities in the way that the, the way that it's supposed to work is that the phone is going to play the advertisements and you shouldn't have to interact with them. 
it's called Perk War Search. It plays ads in the background, but it has a game, like you have to find words. So with this app, you can earn something, maybe 30, 40, 50 cents per day. I know people that have over 50 phones. In my case, I just have about five or six of them. The farm is up from about 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. It's all seven days. That's another thing with phone farms. You get something called battery bloat. Your battery uh, will get so bloated from recharging the phone frequently that it's eventually going to pop out and it's going to stop working. This app is actually considered experimental on the Fire TV. It's called Hideout TV and you're supposed to watch videos that you're actually interested in. And every, every while and then it interrupts the video to actually play an ad. I love watching these dog videos. And uh, as you can see here, I have 126 points. 1800 points is worth $1.60. So once I play play, and each time I get an ad, then I get paid up to four points. And I love watching these dog videos. They are really funny. And so you can find great content here and with this hideout company I can usually earn something between fifteen to twenty dollars per per month. I'm striving for for the day that I don't have to do this anymore and that I can just get a regular job. Uh, I have been in IT for from a very young age. I started to like computers when I was five years old. And and I never thought I would see the day that I'm answering surveys about what type of movies I like to watch or what do I shop for at the grocery store. Well, I'm going to work in accounting as a tax accountant. That's what I'm studying right now. So, M Turk's not the end all. <laughs> in 20 years, I hope to have a family with some kids. I guess a typical American dream and be good in tax accounting, have some sort of steady employment there. I used to do Uber, they deactivate my account for some false, uh, claim, false report, you know? Mm. Because there are so many drivers in that, like, uh, past two months who got deactivated false, falsely. Mm. Like, any person, like, let's say you took a ride right now with me, right? You're my customer and you will say, you report after the ride, like, this driver was drunk. Uber not gonna ask me anything, they just gonna close my account. Mm. I cre created a WhatsApp group. Mm. In that group we have like almost 40 drivers who got deactivated. Mm. I have two friends. They have never drink in their whole life. Mm. They're very strictly Muslims, right? Mm. Never drink and they're falsely reported that they drink alcohol mm. and Uber deactivated both of them. Passengers do that because they get a free ride. Uber give them, like, let's say if a passenger says, I'm having trouble, right? And I had a bad ride, they will give them a free ride for like 10 bucks or something. So how do you get reactivated? Once you you can't. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, you can try. They, they say, oh, we can give you appeal, but they never give you appeal. In a lot of these platforms, wield immense power to determine who can and can't work on them. We, in the book, we talk about workers who, workers for Mechanical Turk who had their, had their accounts deactivated and were not returned the money that they had earned in their accounts. So in Hustle and Gig, I speak to an individual, Donald, who turns to TaskRabbit as a way to make a go of things after a long period of unemployment. And he suddenly gets deactivated by TaskRabbit and has no idea why. And it later turns out that he was deactivated because he was rude to the service representative on the phone when he spoke to TaskRabbit. Think about um, your average full-time job and say you're working away, you're working away, and maybe you have some kind of grievance with your boss. There's a recourse. You can go to your boss's boss, you can go to HR, you can hire a lawyer, you can do all kinds of things. If you're working for one of these platforms, and it's, it's, it's a core part of your life, it's a substantial part of your economic well-being, 
and now there's some kind of grievance, your account gets suspended, your work gets rejected, whatever, there's no one to go to. If somebody accused the driver he was drunk, okay, Uber should say, okay, please go to the, there should be some kind of office where drivers go right away, have a drug test, you know, because there should be a chance. Driver, you cannot get just take somebody's word and deactivate your partner. You call them a partner, you don't treat your partner like that, you know, right? I was uh, look like drunk, but I never drink uh, you know alcohol or anything of kind of that. And you're in your whole life, right? You never drink? Yeah, no, I never, never touch in my life. And uh, they just deactivate your yeah, account, yeah, right? You know, is that because we are Muslim? This is bad thing in my religion too. Yeah. So. So this guy is the one guy. I, I have many guys who are like that. Me, myself, I never drink in my life. In my religion, it says uh, drinking up, drinking, uh, what do you say, uh, one sip of the alcohol means God will not accept any of your prayer for 40 days. So right, we take that very seriously, you know. Drivers are like a piece of tissue paper for them. They can use it and throw it away. Simple as that. Yes, I had a very big problem this week with my phone and essentially uh, my job, <laughs> since my phone is my job, my phone died and basically I missed two days of work. Not much more than that. It was just two days where I had scheduled blocks and since I wasn't able to sign in, I can't go on the website. It doesn't allow you. You have to do the app. Minimum 120 because I usually, if I try to work seven days a week, which I try to do, I'll make 60 a day and then stop. So then I still have a lot of a day left over and then I'm making 420 every seven days and that's, that's perfect for me and my needs. But I've had a lot of setbacks this past two months. The last time we were together and talking about this issue, I had recently been entered into a program called Dasher Rewards and it's a program that's new that they're trying for different regions. It was good, it allowed me to schedule whenever I wanted. I got priority over other drivers. Um, all sorts of benefits. It was great. So happy about it. Then the fiasco happened where I was getting like double and triple orders sent to me and customers got upset because their food wasn't as hot as it should have been. It took too long to get to them. And uh, my rating went down a lot in the course of a month. It went down from 4.86 to 4.63. So on the first, I got an email from them saying, sorry, you know, you met all the other criteria, but that, oh, so awesome to not have to worry about scheduling in advance. And then, you know, oh, now that I am scheduled, now that I got the block, now I have to like work right then. And if I don't sign in a half hour, I get kicked out. You know, I'm like, I, the whole appeal of working for Uber or any of these companies is that you work when you want. I feel like DoorDash put me in this scenario by giving me, inundating me with, I've never had this many deliveries every day, multiple double orders. And so it affected me. The customers, enough customers got burned and my customer, my rating went down deservedly. But it wasn't like it was necessarily just me doing it. It was DoorDash like being like, come on. You can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't say that I'm going to get deactivated if my customer rating is poor, but then give me so many orders that inevitably my customer rating is going to be poor. You can't do it to me. Actually, let's go to that fucking TLC car. No, there's a poor people over there. Yeah. 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 Thank you, guys. It's one there. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they're doing it. I remember last year, I was eating my lunch in my car, and uh, the engine was on because it was cold, so the heat is on. And they're like, uh, oh, we're giving you a ticket. I'm like, for what? They said, oh, because your engine was on for more than four minutes. I'm like, come on, guys, it's freezing cold, so I have to turn the heat on, you know? They don't care, you know? How much are the tickets? Uh, it was 125. We have families. We have uh, kids. You know, my son is he's, he's almost 10 months, and I didn't celebrate any holiday with him. Not the new year, uh, not the Christmas, 
So what are you gonna say to me one day? Like, where's the, you know, where's the picture? <laughs> yeah. Where have you been, Dad? And I'm like, I've been working, you know, and uh, nobody cares. So that's the situation. I don't have an army. It's in the car where it's supposed to be. I'm sorry? No, I am no, a driver. We are a driver. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, there's a stop sign over here? We got our own jobs to do that we're protesting for everything, but we're not here to, to mess with you too much. But we just want to understand, like, a lot of times, what rules that we're breaking. Over at the ferry terminal, they're like, they got like 12 guys already today. What do you guys think? I mean, like, because there's a lot of new TLC drivers, right? Because Uber and Lyft, they just came in and hired a bunch of drivers. Who? Huh? <laughs> he's not getting into the politics of it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, he's got, okay. he's got his job. So. All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. They said that they were stopping guys because they were uh, ultimately uh, not stopping completely on the stop sign line. They're not stopping on the line, right? Even if they stop and they stop past the line, they're still going to write them a ticket. They have to be able to bring in revenue in order to pay for the actual service that they, that they do, which is to write more tickets to get more revenue so that they can have a job. Thank you. Appreciate the support. So the Administrative Bill 5 in California is a law that has been passed, uh, but not signed as, the as yet, that will reclassify drivers for plat platform drivers as workers as employees. Um, it'll be really interesting to see like one how gig economy companies respond to it. They've already said like they're not going to voluntarily change the classification of their workers from independent contractors to employees. The bill is very much there to reduce companies from or prevent companies from exploiting workers and having a low wage workforce that's also responsible for all their own bills and expenses as independent contractors. It really uh, protects um, independent workers, um, and uh, but then we also saw that uh, Uber already uh, preemptively created this alliance of uh, with with some other companies and raised. Uh, uh, there, as I saw different uh, numbers between 30 and 90 million uh, dollars uh, fund to essentially exempt themselves from this. Some occupations have won an exemption. So doctors, attorneys, um, real estate agents, grant writers, essentially individuals who are well paid are no longer are not covered by AB5. No one knows what will happen. We don't we know that the governor will sign the bill. But in the aftermath of that, there will be a massive legal fight between Uber and Lyft and the state of California. And it will be over law, not over the substance of workers' lives. If you give drivers the real status of being a real independent contractor, then you don't have to deal with all this. And then AB5 is it's, it's that bill which draws that line either you make the drivers your employees and treat them like employees and not call them an independent contractor, but then treat them more than a part-time employee. So that's what we are fighting for to be a real independent contractor. In the end, what will happen is if they push comes to shove, they'll simply turn off the app in California. Uber and Lyft will simply just turn off the app. They exist in other places and they'll just see what happens when millions of Californians can't get to work the next day. Because that's what power is. That's what economic power is. The, the same way that unions in the 1930s asserted their economic power by sitting down in a General Motors factory and stopping the supply chain, well, that's the same kind of power that Uber has today. That's real power. It's not gonna come from lawyers in fancy suits. 
It's going to come from the confrontation between workers and capital. So we are in downtown uh, Manhattan by South Ferry. Um, Mayor de Blasio put a cruising cap, which is allowing TLT drivers to get locked out. It's no fun being locked out. Uh, you know, we're all uh, here to earn a living. We want to get up in the morning and be able to work. And, you know, you turn on your phone and it says, no, you're locked out, you can't go to work. How are you supposed to pay your bills like that? Uh, you know, a lot of drivers who work off apps yeah. are getting locked yeah. out. Oh, really? Yeah, so, you know, you, 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 you're supposed to be able to wake up, jump in your car and turn it on, but they, yeah. get, they lock them out so they can't make money, but they have leases to pay. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? You too, you too. They, I'm locked out right now. I can go, uh, I can go online, wow. it, you know. Uh, for another three, four hours because oh, yeah, other right. drivers have booked it on. What's happening right now is that we're the civilians caught in the crossfire between a multi-billion dollar company and a multi-trillion dollar city. Absolutely. And the issue here is that we, we've we got rocks to throw. So the only thing we can do if we're, we're, we're many, which we are, but we're hard to organize because we're like a herd of cats. Yeah is to slow down the means of production of the city, which will get the attention, not only of the media, but it'll get the attention of, of those who make the legislative laws here. So I would start out once a week, where we do 12 cars in a row, you know, slowing down the means of production, going up the streets the way that we're choosing to do it, and doing it once a week. You only need 12, because it'll, it'll block up the streets. I need one flyer. Sure, sure. Park in front of that car. You're welcome. It should be United Drivers of USA, not New York. We are fighting for the whole country. I've been a three and a half years driver and I've been considered as one of the best Uber drivers in Manhattan. I have their emails from them. As we are independent contractors, so we should have the rights to come online and go offline as we wish. You know, we all have to stand united over here. If we don't stand united, nobody's going to listen, hmm. you know. And it's such a big company, we need some rights. Chocolate shake, medium, vanilla shake, medium, apple slices, 10 McNuggets meal, 1% low fat milk. Can I get a medium chocolate shake? Okay. And then a medium vanilla shake. Anything else? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Can I get a receipt as well? You're definitely going to get it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Got the two shakes. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Funny you ask about the Dasher Rewards program. So it's, I'm on month month two now that I've been out of it. And um, it's been taking forever for my score to go back up. Um, I'm guessing it's because when it went down so severely, those, those are some pretty negative scores. And they're still being averaged into my good deliveries that I've been making this past month. So it's taking a long time and it went from a 4.63 up to a 4.68, then back down to 4.63 and it stayed there for like two weeks. And just this past week, it went up to a 4.65, then a 4.67, then a 4.68. And I was like, here we are, this is great. Two points away and I'm back in the program. And then it went back down last night to a 4.64. I don't know what to make of it, but I don't even care anymore. I really don't because scheduling, which was becoming more difficult, has become easy again. So I'm able to really schedule everything I want again. And uh, work has been going great. It's been going great because I've been getting inundated with double orders still. And I just hit, I, I just ignore them. I just, they just go away. Um, you know, I don't even hit decline anymore. I'm just like, you know, go, go fuck yourself. my parallel parking skills have vastly improved.
We're not gonna go behind each other, we're gonna go in separate lanes. Slow down, we should we should be in a block together. We we are a light apart, so just slow down, let us catch up to you guys. Yeah. This is how we're gonna do like a slow roll. This is what's gonna happen. This is what's gonna happen. Absolutely. We have to make a noise for the city officials to come up and listen. We get tossed by by TLC, by the city, and by Uber and Lyft. Who's that? FDNY. Yep. That's why you leave one lane open. Yeah. Yeah, this is good. I've loved this job more than any other job I've ever had. It's great. Um, I love driving. I love making money while driving. I love not having a person standing over me, micromanaging me and telling me what to do. Um, uh, the only thing is, is jobs like this may not exist forever because, you know, at some point everything's going to become automated. You know, robots and shit. I'm really really grateful that jobs like this exist that there's apps such as doordash and uber and uber eats lyft and grubhub all, all and there's so many now it's a great opportunity to provide work for people who want to <coughs> think outside the box and you know work for themselves it's awesome i'm very uh, optimistic about the future of this stuff falling short only of course when the robots take over <laughs> other than robot automation which is a very possible thing this is like a gift. I love it. Oh, I love it so much. I would do it until I'm no longer able to get into a car and drive. So the officers pulled us over, they, they, they monitor, they have cameras on each light. Look at that, these are all NYPD cameras right at the corners. So they can see it. I'm not going to say you guys purposely slowed down traffic, okay? okay. I, I know for a fact you guys did, okay? You guys are protesting something, whatever you guys got to do. Don't do that on my streets because you're creating motorists behind you getting aggressive. Stick to one light. Or, you know, so columns. You're okay with columns? Hey, no, just don't blow oh, turn. I'm going to cut you a verbal warning today. Do you understand that? I do. Get to an intersection. If the intersection is clear, go through. If the process, you know for a fact that light's going to change. Just stop. Through, stop there. Don't hold on my traffic. Don't cause any conditions that I have to be aware of and I have to go chase you guys down. Uh, right? well, what, what we need to figure out how to do is figure out how to pressure the city to stop the crap that that's killing us that's on what, I know, that's uh, us. I, that's I, us. I, I, I know, that, I know. How much is this ticket? I don't know. I'm uh, trying to figure it out. It's right here. It'll be... It's like 138 bucks. Most of, most of the violations no, no. are 138 yeah. But it's a good thing, though. Now, 
we can talk to NYPD. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we can get a fucking permit. Right. Dude, I have nothing wrong with NYPD. Oh, no, Most neither of the do time, I. Those guys I've met are... Dermot Mature. Yeah. They're mature, they're reasonable. Uh, he's it's chief the TLC of detectives. That's never been reasonable. Like, but if they're reasonable, they should have understand we are doing a protest. All right. No, no, I'm going to grab some yeah. more dollars. Yeah. Oh, All right, All right. We're going to the airport. Yeah. Oh. yeah. But here's the thing, when you have 100 cars, they're not going to pull everybody over, right? But we have to do it the right way and we have to get the permit. So we'll talk to NYPD about the next one and we'll get a permit on each avenue for two lanes. So that we are, we are in two lanes and then we'll form a caravan in two lanes and that's how we will go down. All of the marketing for gig economy platforms is about this idea of community and entrepreneurship and being your own boss and coming together with other people. And this is gonna be this great movement forward. And the reality, when you even dig just the tiniest level below the surface, is very different. You know, what we see is a high level of exploitation. We see workers who are exposed to a high level of risk. We see that individuals are not able to have this perfect lifestyle um, and ends up being very much a facade, a myth. The digital economy right now is profoundly unequal. A few people are becoming billionaires while the rest of us are not. The rest of us are living in a world of wage stagnation and economic insecurity. So the question is, how do we turn this into a shared prosperity? It's the same question that confronted us in the Gilded Age, that confronted us in the 1930s, in the midst of the Great Depression. How do we stand up together and demand that we live in a democracy again? Think about what kind of world of work do we want for our kids and grandkids? And what kind of social safety net do we want for them? You know, it needs to uh, trigger the imagination of people and you know imagine a different world and also understand that capitalism isn't at all inevitable that like the you know ultimate success of uber isn't isn't not at all inevitable as we confront this digital age we confront both its gross inequality but also this possibility of being independent of being self-determined of being more autonomous which are at its core very conservative, very old American values that I think we still share. None of us want to go to an office every day. None of us want to go to a factory or a mine. We want to decide when and where we work, how we work, and with whom that we work. And we want to spend time with our families. And this is what the possibility is for work in the 21st century. And instead of trying to look backwards, clawing and clinging to this old industrial model, we should think about how to make this new world of work work for all of us.